All right. Happy New Year. We are back. So the holidays are over. Yeah. It's, it's 2018 and we're back. Like Lovecraft Using Podcast is back. Matt has a prize. Uh, the reason why you can't see me is because either my computer or Google is acting up. If, if you're watching on YouTube, that is. If you're listening later, you're like, of course I can't see. I'm in my car, you idiot. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, Happy New Year. And, Matt, why don't you talk about your prize, okay. and we will um, go from there. This is uh, a Kickstarter thing, probably available commercially, but the creative team of Pro Rex and Aona Bella. Very talented, very nice girls. They are putting out their littlest Lovecraft, and this is the uh, Shadow out of uh, Shadow over Innsmouth. It's a picture book. Uh, this particular copy is signed by the creative team, and it can be yours if you win the prize. I want that. All right. Or unless Kelly sends me a better offer. Yeah, let me just say too that. If for any reason this video gets kicked out today, I'll start a new one and post the link on uh, if on the message board on YouTube, you know, the Lovecraft Easing group, or I will, and no, I will do that, but also if you're not on that message board, if you're not in that group, just go to my YouTube page, Lovecraft Easing YouTube. That's all you got to do is, um, is Google that. So just in case that happens, I've got a, a kind of a bad feeling. Anyway. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for being with us. Let's do intros for those who are new. I'm Mike Davis, uh, Lovecraft Easing Chief Cook and Bottle Washer. And Rick, you're next. I'm Rick Lay, uh, writer. Pete. Pete Rollick, uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> Matt. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I... I'm allegedly editing Pickman's Gallery. All right, that's everybody. Um, <laughs> Kelly, sorry. Oh, what? Uh, am I on this show? Um, Kelly Young, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Okay. Who is the editor of Strange Eons Magazine? The editor in chief is Rick Tillman. Okay. You're you're like. His boss. You tell him what to do all day long. That's kind of the opposite of what I do. <laughs> Who does all the work for the magazine? I, what work? I do all the work. Just, Justin Steele, of course. <laughs> I do. I do all of the. Um, I, I'm the face of the magazine, and I do most of the oh, layout really? stuff. Yeah. Wait, you're the face. You're the, of the face. Magazine? I am the you're face. The I hate to see the other parts. <laughs> some might say I'm the dick of the magazine, but well, I, I, no, not thanks. some. Most, most. <laughs> uh, Happy New Year, you guys! It's been uh, really hard to not see you every fucking week. <laughs> welcome back, Kelly. Yeah, welcome back. I I did miss doing this every Sunday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it gets old not having anyone to insult, and I know you feel the same way, Kelly. That's true. That's true. Plus, I have no real friends, so. <laughs> this, that's literally true, so we shouldn't laugh at that. So, <laughs> um, All right. L let's tackle a very controversial subject. Christmas, what did you guys get over the holidays? What did you get? I know you got something really cool and Lovecraftian, um, Kelly. Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> I've got music of the devil god cult, strange sounds from Dunwich, from the Dunwich Horror on vinyl. This is actually um, from 1970, and it is the the vinyl soundtrack from the movie. That's magnificent. Pretty yeah. cool, huh? I'm going to go get my Christmas present. I'll be right back. <laughs> and vinyl. then I also... Pick this up. Vinyl has gotten so expensive. Oh yeah, that yeah. Uh, I also picked this up, and I think that um, is. Did Rick go somewhere? <laughs> I have to get my gift. 
Oh, they're, they're um, getting their gifts. I got this uh, very cool to... for myself. House of Hammer magazine issue number one, volume one, number one. And in the 70s, Hammer Films put out a bunch of kind of pulpy magazines. Uh, they had Hammer's House of Horror and this one, House of Hammer. But I've always wanted this one because it starts the comic book adaptation continuation of Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter, which is my favorite Hammer film. And inside it actually has in this issue a um, a adaptation of Dracula, the Hammer version. So the the art you know looks like Christopher Lee. It's a very cool magazine. It's in really nice shape. So this was a, a present I bought myself. I believe there was a copyright problem with Kronos. All sorts of copyright problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, they, the guy they, who who wrote it claimed the guy who wrote and filmed it claimed that he owned the copyright and that that kind of stopped them from doing it. But I'm not sure how that could possibly be true. Oh, it's Brian Clemens, by the way, who uh, worked in the uh, Emma Peel Avenger TV series. Right. So somehow he's he's got some kind of hold on. I do know that there is a uh, a new novelization of the Captain Kronos film, and I have not heard very good things about it. Yeah, but I, I, I read it. It stinks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no middle ground there. That's right. So that was my cool stuff. Rick, what about you? I've got what every kid should get. Dr. Seuss, Call of Cthulhu. Oh, that is nice. I've got a copy of that. Yeah. That's from Chaosium, isn't it? If I remember right. Yes, it is a Chaosium publication. It looks yeah. um, bigger than a regular Dr. Seuss book. Is it the actual text from the story? No, it's, I mean, it's rewritten as if Dr. Seuss had written Call of Cthulhu. I like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, anything else, Rick? No, that's it. Pete, what about you? What did I get for Christmas? I got for Christmas. Well, this was a present that I sort of gave to myself. And O'Clark Ashton is a collection of poetry. Um inspired by Clark Ashton Smith, of course, and I have two poems in this. Yes, yeah, so you get to see Pete the Poet. Yeah, which, you know, you don't get to see every day. There once was a poet named Rollo. Who's, no, never mind. But, <laughs> but the big thing... There, so yeah, it would be easier to do there once was a poet named Pete and then let your mind run wild from there. I've had this poster for a while, but we got it framed. Oh, the uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, signed? Autograph. This is an original theatrical release poster. Is it signed by the whole cast? It's signed by Little Nell, Patricia Quinn, and Barry Boswick. Wow. And we took it down and got it signed. We're going to put it up on the wall this week. Oh. So. It's a little ratty, but you know, you don't see originals every day. So no, you don't, and you don't see see signed originals every day either. Yeah, so I'm pretty. You know, that's sort of a a, family, a present to the family because we're going to put it up on the wall. Jeez, thanks, Dad. And uh, you know, the family motto is keeping it creepy. So, uh, yeah. A family who creeps together stays together. That's right. Um, in prison. <laughs> <clears throat> Any you Matt? Anything for you? What did you get? I got two things. Okay, one is um, you may not know this, uh, but the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society does a, a yearly solstice gift exchange called the Secret Shoggoth. Where you sign up and uh, you tell them if you can participate worldwide your own country only, North America, whatever, and you get your secret shoggy that you have to send a present to. No uh, no restrictions except I guess they want you to spend about 20 bucks. And then someone else sends you a present. It's completely random. 
So I got this actually quite lovely, uh, looks like an original piece of art. Uh, it's this, this print. Uh, it's the last lines to A Shadow Over Innsmouth. Yeah, and lo look at this nice print at the top. Wow. So that was... Do, do we know who created that? Um, okay, I'm certain I'm supposed to know. It says Matt, Eo Saturnalia, and uh, the initials are A-M. And uh, there's an address here. I'm supposed to send them a thank you note like a couple weeks ago, but I'm getting around to it. They're from California, whoever they are. But I thought that so we've narrowed question. it down to people whose initials are AM. To, in California. Who might have created this. In California, right. Unless this guy stole it right. from somewhere and sent it to me. Um, so that's really nice. And anybody can participate if you uh, just get on the uh, HP Lovecraft Historical website. And the next time they start talking about secret Shoggoth, go ahead and sign up. You never know what you might pick up. They, uh, they do this every year at Christmas time? Oh, please. It's the solstice. Okay. Sorry, whatever. Um, anyway, but for Christmas... I'm an atheist, and I still say Christmas time, so... Yeah, but they don't, so... Don't, yeah, don't, well, don't, don't let the war on Christmas people hear what you're saying, Matt. Um, well, for Christmas from my family, I essentially got permission, uh, which is we've decided my Christmas present is going to be a new aquarium. I used to have a very nice aquarium in San Antonio. I haven't had one for about five years. So we went out and we ordered it today. It's going to be installed, and over the next several months, we're going to build it up. We're already picking out what we're going to put in it. Salt water or fresh? I prefer fresh water because salt water requires a degree of attention that I don't think I can give to the tank. You, it's hard to go out of town. Uh, you have to always have to have someone running the boat. Oh. Froze up. oh, Matt froze. I'm glad it's not me. You uh, the kind of fish where if you go out of town and they mostly live, you're really a success. You know, I um, know someone who with, has a saltwater aquarium, and I'm amazed that he doesn't kill everything in it, you know, with all the attention that you have to pay to those things. Yeah, you know, my kids tried to have fish, and they both died. They either you, overfed it or underfed them. Your kids died? My kids fish. Oh, they, were, they were very young. There are certain tricks for salt uh, freshwater tanks, too. I mean, it, these fish are constantly excre excreting nitrogenous waste, which gets washed away in a big environment. But in a little tank, you've got to have the appropriate filtration, preferably plants. But if you don't do a change out of the water every two weeks at the least, like, say, a quarter of the water, 20% of the water, and put in fresh water to remove the nitrogenous waste, then you end up with this crisis, and all the fish are going to die. Um, yeah. I've been Kelly. You have a saltwater aquarium, don't you? I've got a freshwater aquarium. Oh, come on. Yeah. I thought I was insulting you. Damn it! Oh. <laughs> what do you got in it? <laughs> um, what do I have in it? I actually put a. Um, well, I, I've had. I started my tank cycle with tetras, and I still have all those. And then I have some. Uh, glass fish that are the ones that are kind of invisible, but you can see their skeletons. And then I I dropped a mall or a, a beta in there to see if it would get along with everybody, and it does. And so I've got this nice, beautiful beta in there, and and then the usual suspects. I've got a algae eater and a couple of snails and things like that. I, I don't. I've never been successful with a beta getting along with anything in my tank. They just run so, around like assassins. What's what's been going on now is that, well, of course, the betas were the Japanese fighting fish. But the, um, by the way, everybody, welcome to the Aquarium Easy podcast. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, when when you said that, I keep thinking of from Russia with love and Blofeld. Right, and uh, the thing is, is the betas got popular, and the breeders have been breeding the fight out of them to make them more beautiful. And so, you know, each fish has its own personality anyway. So you never really know what's going to happen until you give it a try. But I lucked out with That's the kind of like the carpenter family. They breed the fight out of us, but make us more beautiful. It's like, <laughs> I'm not sure and, and that's what happened. Kelly sent me pictures of his uh, photos of his aquarium, and it's, it's a really nice one. How many gallons? It's 30 gallon. Okay, yeah. I had a 30 gallon in Texas. 
But this baby, I got permission. I went and bought a 90-gallon tank. Oh, wow. Man, well, I cannot wait to see what, what goes in on there. Uh, probably well, well, this entire discussion that. is related into Lovecraft related to Lovecraft in some way and it's up to you the listener to figure out how it relates to Lovecraft okay so we're, we can't do everything for you you're gonna have to figure that out so I usually get a Pocosmos and I name it Dagon <laughs> well uh, there you go you gave it away Carl, Carl Jacoby wrote a story called the Aquarium Aquarium I was just gonna say that where where, where <laughs> Fish are really the great old ones, or something like that. So yeah, well, that's a that's very cool, Matt. Nice. Merry Christmas to you. I will just bring over my large fishbowl. <laughs> well, I got a gift from my family that I could go on to Comixology was having this huge sale, and graphic novels dc graphic novels that are usually like 15 20 bucks which is not something i can afford uh were for all 4.99 so i was able to go in and select uh, a few dc graphic novels and that was one of my my gifts one of my favorite gifts so um which graphic novels did you select Oh wow! Well, what, here's you like this, Rick. One of the ones that I selected was uh, Batman in the Shadow. Oh, uh, that's a good one. I have not read it, but it's a good. Story. Oh, it's yeah, that's a dream team up, you know. Um, I yeah, I selected, of course, obviously, for anyone who knows me, a lot of Batman ones and Justice League ones, things like that. But the the Batman in the Shadow one was the one I read first, and it was very good, <laughs> I guess. From what do you say? Yeah, it was very good. I didn't know what to expect, really. I had read, so. I had read the early Batman Shadow team ups from the seventies. Yeah. Um, hey, since we got a little uh, comic book talk going on here, um, I picked up something that Matt had recommended last year, and I think it was towards the beginning of the year, called "Nameless" by Grant Morrison. And wow. That uh, really satisfied my outer space horror craving. It was so good, and it was so cinematic, and all I could think was, why aren't we watching a movie based on this? Uh, and it did you get about the author's comments in the back? Yes. Uh, that was, to me, very enlightening. It's like it's, they were interested in Lovecraftian, and they were interested in outer space, but they didn't want anything to be – they wanted it more a feel than a reference. Cosmic yes, and I not pastiche, in other words. Absolutely, yeah. They don't use any of the Lovecraftian names or anything like that. Brilliant. So the, the nameless, okay. Yeah, it's just nameless, and wow, it was just so, so good. I, I put it down afterwards, and I thought, why did it take me two years to find this? It reminded me a lot of Third Space. The I'm Babylon not familiar 5. with that. There's a Babylon 5 movie. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. I can't believe I haven't read this. I'm going to have to, to check it out when I get some extra cash. I think I can send it to you. Morrison, you know? Oh, you can? Thanks, Pete. Yeah, I think I have an extra copy. You're, you're referring to the one about the afterlife. Was that the third space one? Uh, third space is the one where they find a giant gate that's sealed. And okay. they decide to open it. Oh, that was the archaeology. Okay, now I remember. <clears throat> that had a female well, archaeologist in it, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. While we're yeah. still on comics, there's a new one called The Grave, and it's loosely based on the statement of Randolph Carter. It's, I believe, don't quote me, but I believe that it's on, it's not in print, but it's on it is on Comicsology, and it's only a dollar ninety nine. So for you comic book readers out there who are into Lovecraft, and I'm assuming that at least a few people in the audience. Uh, just go to Comixology and, and look for The Grave. What, what's so. the name of the one that you had suggested, Pete, about the gate? Um, no, it's it's a Babylon 5 movie. Oh. The Third Space. Okay. Okay. It was somewhat, I, I, as I remember, it had to do with like uh, uh, archaeologists finding some weird pathway to another dimension. Yep. What I think about is interesting about Nameless is, you know, it's like 
this is absolutely not formulaic and you consider the depth of thought put into the story by Grant Morrison and his co-creators. It's like when you read his commentary, it's like they really researched this pretty intensely. Yeah, I was pretty stunned at how deep they delved into uh, the, the stuff that the – I don't want to give anything away really. But the stuff that the book goes into, and it it just made me wonder – because Grant Morrison is not sitting around writing one comic, Mm-mm. you know, he's he's writing dozens of comics at the same time, and I think he's the editor in chief of Heavy Metal right now. I think really? so. The guy is just, you know, he's done a lot at DC. Yeah, and he his mind must just be constantly just burning through all sorts of ideas. I I can't wait to read this. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for bringing this up because. I think I'd heard about it before, but it, it went out. I'm like, I don't know what, what happened, but I'm really yeah, looking forward to reading it. Matt brought it up, and I think we were talking about Lovecraftian comics or something. This was several months ago, and I put it on my list, mm-hmm. and then over the break, I, I was like, oh, yeah, this. You, you can get it as a graphic novel? Yeah, it's a yes. compilation. If you get the hardcover one, Rick, it has these uh, art galleries in the back, plus what I think was the most invaluable was the um, – author's comments okay which so are also available on the kindle version of it too mike so. okay all right okay. um which be which would be these days comiXology um and pete if, if you do indeed have an extra copy i appreciate you sending that to me thanks a lot yeah i'll see what i can do um if if it turns out you can't let me know and i'll i'll save up uh, what movies did you guys see over the holiday? I'm going to start with one, and now we can maybe alternate or something. Uh, let's talk about. I saw 1922 finally. So, uh, Stephen King. Did you care for that movie at all, Kelly? I loved it. <laughs> I, and I, I know we're going to butt heads on this. I thought it was better than it. <laughs> Yeah, that's saying a lot. It is Lovecraftian in the sense that it borrowed from Rats in the Walls, even though it doesn't deal with cosmic horror. Yeah, I did think that a little bit, but it felt more to me like it was uh, it was King's homage to Poe, really. Sort of the black cat was rats. Yes. <laughs> well, I hated it actually. I, I know you did. <laughs> It just stunned me when you told me that. Yeah, because you said that, you know, I like those quiet ghost stories and quiet haunted house stories, and I do. But this struck me as somehow different. Um, I didn't really see it as a ghost story, even though there are, well, I'll stop right there for those who haven't seen it. It's on Netflix, by the way, um, for anybody out there who doesn't doesn't know that. But no, I, you know, I saw it with Logan and, and and Danielle and Danielle's sister, and when it was done, all four of us just went, ugh, uh, thumbs down on that one. Well, so. see, I can I can understand people maybe not liking it because it is the feel bad movie of the year, but I can't I can't comprehend anybody coming away from it and saying it's not a good movie because it's beautifully shot, it's wonderfully acted. Um, well, oh, let me really? interrupt you, sorry, and say that I don't think it was it, – it was very beautifully done. I – and this is the thing that I think a lot of people, when they review, forget. It's it's subjective. I personally did not like it. But, yes, I can see how people would would think it was a great movie if, if they're not me. So, go on. No, I just thought it was spectacular. I, I I remember reading the novella that it was based on, and that was one that I put down afterwards, and I was like, geez, I need a good cry after this. And I felt like uh, the filmmakers did a wonderful job of adapting it. It felt very much like a um, – oh, who did The Mist? Frank Darabont. It felt very much like a Frank Darabont film. Isn't it in uh, – in, uh, after uh, – after sunset, I think it's full dark, no stars. I don't remember now. It's one where you only have like three or four stories. Yeah, it was a it was a collection of four novellas. 
I do remember starting it some years ago and not not finishing it. It was definitely the best in that group of four also. Hmm. Okay. Uh, no, nobody else watched it? Well, I loved it. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, I enjoyed it. It was, it was, in fact, <laughs> I thought it was not creepy enough. I I liked the relate. I thought the most fascinating thing was the relationship between the father and the son in that whole movie. Right, which is you know awful. I told Mike that's why uh, that's why Danielle didn't like it. She didn't like seeing a, a man and his son committing murder on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what her problem is with that. Uh, yeah, you know what you just can't explain why some people don't like that sort of thing but it's a comp it's a very complex relationship on many levels yeah yeah so and I, I would never write a review saying this is a bad movie because i don't believe it i just am saying i didn't personally care for it that, now that's all. on the other hand you know the comment kelly made the comment that it it reminded him of a frank darabont movie and yes, The Mist is a fabulous movie. I own it. But you know, I've only watched it once. Yeah, so, yeah. we've yeah. talked about this before. I can't watch that movie ever again. Yes. Yeah, and when I said that, I wasn't talking about the um, the content yeah. so much as the fact that it felt very much like it could have played as a double feature with either The Green Mile or The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, just a really nice, solid period piece. I thought it was head and shoulders above Gerald's game, which was also a Netflix original the month before. Which um, I didn't watch. Well, Kelly and Philip and I did a Patreon podcast on Gerald's game. So wow. yeah, well, there was, was there was a lot of laughter in that. That was one of our funnest Patreon discussions. Yeah. Well what was your opinion say, of Gerald's game, Mike? Mine? I didn't care for it. Oh, I I enjoyed that one too. But I, I didn't know. I didn't really care for that either. I think the general consensus was we didn't care for it. Yeah, but you believe me, you got to listen to that Patreon podcast to hear us arrive at those conclusions because it's it was a funny one, and I think Philip had been drinking half the day. No, so, he had been up since four that morning, and then decided to drink while we were having the podcast. So he turned out to be a barrel full of laughs. Yeah, and I can always use more patrons. You know, I my it's, this it, the, this is what keeps me going. You know, uh, so Google Lovecraft Easing Patrons if you're not a patron, and only five bucks a month, and you can listen to all those. So, uh, yeah, Gerald's Game, 1922. Uh, we saw a, a dark song on the Lovecraft Easing movie night last night. Okay, now that movie was actually wonderfully well done, mm -hmm. beautifully shot, beautifully acted, uh, based on actual, a, a real Gnostic ritual. Uh, but I would say it is the exact opposite of Lovecraftianism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and it ended up being, I was thinking the whole time I'm watching it, gosh, my wife would hate this. Gosh, my wife would hate this. And in the end I thought, Gosh, she would have loved that ending. You know, it it's well worth watching. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. It didn't go where I thought it was, but it's a great choice. Beautiful, uh, very, um, very well done, unusual musical score. Um, yeah. The sweeping cinematography on the exterior shots compared to the claustrophobic filming with dark lighting on the interior shots, I thought was very uh, well done. I thought the acting, you know, the characters, you could really get into their skin. But it's not Lovecraftian. It's just, it's just perturbing supernatural fiction. Yeah. But I, I love the portrayal of the sacrifice that would, need, would be needed to do something like that. This isn't just, hey, Hey, Penny Magic or Woodwife Magic. This is big deal, and you know it's going to take effort and sacrifice. And well, that's, what I really liked about that, Pete, was 
the bit that I could tell is they actually went into the rituals that Aleister Crowley performed. They went into the grimoire and they tried to reproduce what it would actually take. Yeah. And they tried to show the deprivations, what that would do to the people involved. So I, I, I agree. It was a beautiful movie, but not, not Lovecraftian. No, it didn't go where I thought it would go. And you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, Crowley yeah. was was into uh, the great uh, Pan. Did they have that in the movie? Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, say it so. was supposedly set in Wales. That's about as close as it got. Um, it was really a, a ritual where you're supposed to try and contact your guardian angel to get a favor granted to you. Okay. Yeah, and there's absolutely nothing that can go wrong when you do a six month long dark ritual, uh, as we all know. Right, not telling the truth to each other. Yeah, well, that's all we can probably say about this movie, but it's it, it's free to watch on Netflix, and it, it really is a beautiful movie in several ways. And, and the other thing I'd say is uh, this should encourage anybody who likes uh, dark movie cinema to join the easy movie nights when they happen because I really have a good time. We all are signed into Rabbit. Mike's, Mike runs the movie and then there's a, a running, it's not an audio commentary, but there's a running text box commentary. Yeah. Um, thanks. It's it's free. Um, it's just something I, I just want to... Wait, wait. What do you mean free? Why am I sending you checks? What the hell? Free for most people. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> He's kidding. Um, it's, you know, I, I just want to, one of my, I think, how do I want to say this? I'm trying to create a community, keep with, you know, Lovecraft easing community, you know, bring people together who have common interests, you know, in Lovecraft and horror. And that's what I've been trying to do the last seven years here. And so that's, again, the idea behind movie night. We do it Saturday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern. That'd be nine central, seven Pacific. Um, if you're interested in joining, all you have to do is go to rabbit, uh, R A B B dot I T. And then uh, when you sign in or sign up, just add me as a friend. And my uh, ID there is Mike Davis 222. Mike Davis 222. And each Saturday night, I'll invite you. I believe there's a cap of 25 people in a room, but we haven't got gotten there yet so i think we're fine so having never done this explain to me um is it an app that you download on your computer or no it's in your browser okay so you're just tied into a website yeah so basically i'm uh last night the movie was on netflix but what i've done in the past is i rent a movie say on amazon that we're the, rent the movie that we're going to watch and it's a large part of your browser screen as you're watching, you're watching everything the exact same moment ever all of your friends that are in the room are watching. And on the right side of the browser, there's a, you know, a text, a vertical text box. And, you know, we talk to each other, you know, like if there's a jump scare, we'll say something or, you know, make funny comments or whatever. We're talking about the movie as it goes. It's, it's really, a, it's a way to watch movies with, people when you're not in the same room with them, you know, or even not in the same continent. That sounds fun. I got to jump in on this. Yeah, it's, it, it is, we've had a really good time and we didn't do it over the holidays. We were doing it before, but we're back on schedule for every Saturday night at 10 PM Eastern. So. And these are movies I haven't otherwise seen. So I'm really pleased to be back doing the movie nights again. Uh, here's another movie I want to mention. Uh, the Last Jedi. Nothing Lovecraftian, but we're all geeks, so we can bring it up. What was that? What movie? The Last The Last Jedi, the movie, yeah. What's a Jedi? I don't know, but it apparently has something to do with Star Wars. You ever watch the Beverly Hillbillies and Uncle Jed? One of his <laughs> disciples. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good show. Did you guys like The Last Jedi? I did. I liked it very much. So did I. It was an enjoyable film. I haven't seen it. Well, I guess I'm just the grump this episode, aren't I? <laughs> you didn't like it. I enjoyed it. 
I didn't. It, it's it's not going to win any awards for writing or anything I, like that. I had a million problems with it, and I walked out very satisfied. Exactly. Well, my, see, my son is a big Star Wars geek. My nineteen-year-old. I'm sorry. So I was. He, yeah, he was going to. We were all going to go see it. But then he was decided instead of studying for finals. I'll underline instead of studying for finals. <laughs> okay, uh, Dad. He and his friends went out and saw the Last Jedi. Um, and Without so, you. Well, the thing is, they were in Madison, Wisconsin, and it's oh. like. So I ended up not seeing it yet, and I'm thinking maybe I'm going to wait till it's on cable. Well, I I did go and see it only because my 15 year old son wanted to see it. Um, I'd say about a third through the movie, roughly, he turns to me and he goes, uh, "So, Dad, do you like the movie?" I was like, and I just said, "It's all right." I said, "Do you like the movie?" He goes, mm, "It's kind of boring." And uh, I was like, yeah, it's, I was waiting for it to pick up too. Another minute or two goes by and he goes, dad, is okay if we leave? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Can I tell you, the only movie. I we walked out, out on it. I nearly walked out of Private Benjamin. But the only movie I ever really wanted to walk out of was My Dinner with Andre. So if you've never seen it, it was like an art movie from, I don't know, the 70s or 80s or some shit. It's about these two guys having a conversation. That's the whole movie. They're talking. They're it's sitting watching these guys eat and talk. And, like, we go there. My dad falls asleep five minutes in. <laughs> Nors through the whole thing. He wakes up ten minutes before it's over. And when we're leaving, he says, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't fucking fallen asleep, we would have left. Well, people just talking in a movie can be well done, as in... Yeah. No, no, they have to talk about something interesting. Well, as in The Man from Earth, which, you know, is one of my very favorite movies, if not my favorite movie. Uh, uh, and Pete, what's... It's, the, there's finally, after, what, 10 years, a sequel, 11 years, a sequel is coming out. Called The Holocene. Yeah. And it's uh, available for rent from Netflix right now. Oh. From Amazon, you mean? Netflix. Oh, you mean on disc? On disc. Yeah, it's not on Netflix streaming. No. I'm hoping it's on Amazon um, to rent because mm -hmm. I'm watching that tonight if it is. <laughs> so <laughs> now, Man, I loved the man from Earth. To, to this one thing, Mike, since you walked out of Return of the Jedi, I guess you didn't see the big fight scene with the guys in red. <coughs> no, I... Did not see, I don't think I saw any fight scenes. I saw Princess Leia flying through space, and I think it was a little <coughs> for that. So. Well, you missed one of the greatest fight scenes in cinema in the history of Star Wars, I'll just say that. Yeah, I'll watch it on YouTube. Sense to me, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll watch it on YouTube. I, I thought that it was, um, if we're still talking about Last Jedi, I thought that it was uh, a necessary... Evil. A necessary move in the direction of this franchise because it's getting a little stale. The Force Awakens proved that it was getting a little stale. Um, and I think it's probably the same people who are complaining that The Force Awakens was too much like the original Star Wars that are also complaining that this one doesn't feel at all like a Star Wars movie. Uh, you know, geek, geek hatred is the best hatred because they hate everything with a fiery passion. Um, for me, it, it, it worked very well because the focus has to be on the, uh, the young cast that is coming in. And when you, when you bring Luke Skywalker into a star Wars movie, it automatically becomes about him. It's like every super, every movie that features Superman is a Superman movie. Exactly. So, so something major had to happen with this, uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to, how, you know, what they do with this third movie. There were, you know, a couple of big things. We're not talking spoilers. There are a couple of things that left me scratching my head going, well, how are they going to deal with this? Yeah. Pete, were you going to say something no. else about the man from Earth? I was not. 
But I was going to say that um, one of the other things I got for Christmas was a compilation of Alfred Hitchcock movies. And the day after Christmas, I sat nice. down with um, my oldest nine-year-old girl. And uh, we watched first, we watched Rear Window, and then we watched Vertigo. And afterwards, she turned to me and she said, best movies ever. <laughs> And you know, not and not that scary, really. I mean, I mean, not not nightmarish. In, in, oh in my God! She when Raymond Burr opens the door to the apartment, she freaked. I know, but I'm I'm saying not nightmarish in the psycho sense. I'm right, probably. right. Well, that's next week. <laughs> I, I was they're more. I would say more suspense. Right, more suspense rather than horror. But she felt you know rear window builds up and builds up and builds up and then. You know, it has 30 seconds of really great action. I mean, there are just talking heads, right? Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's so referential. It's like so many movies have riffed off of that yep. or unconsciously borrowed from it. It's like actually a big cultural touchstone. And that is one of the reasons I want to show these things to my kids so that when – Rick and Morty riffs off this, or The Simpsons, or wherever, they have the cultural appreciation to know where that came from. Um, I think it's really important to understand where all this stuff is, where stuff comes from. Um, yeah, interesting point. thing about uh, Vertigo, um, back in 1997, Isabel went to a conference in San Diego, I mean San Francisco, for her work, and I went with her as like a, a visiting spouse, we took time off and went to the Castro Theater, and they were showing the restored version of Vertigo. Nice. And then we got to go around the city and visit some of those places, like we went to that part of the Redwood Forest, and it was really marvelous. What an experience. I read a, I read a little article. Um, the hotel she lives in is, is called the Empire Hotel. Um, it has since been renovated, and it's now called the Vertigo Hotel. <laughs> and Pete, the uh, the finale to that triple feature should have been uh, Mel Brooks' High Anxiety. There, you know, I love that film, and I will wait until she's twelve <laughs> because yeah. there are some things I don't want to have to explain to her. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah. sorry to keep. I'm not trying to keep directing the conversation to the man from Earth, but I did just look it up while you guys were talking on Amazon. And it's available, it will be available for Blu-ray and DVD on February, February the 27th. But it's you can pre-order it. But it doesn't stream. I wanted to be able to stream it. Well, they may add that option on February 27th. I hope they do, because I would I rather just stream, stream it. It's prime, you know, so I don't have to pay any extra money. I doubt it's going to be on Prime right away. So, but anyway, for those who are interested in the sequel to possibly one of the best movies of all time, February 27th. Speaking of the best movie of all time, um, I actually didn't go to the theater at all this Christmas, which is unusual for me, but we saw, like, I don't know, watched 10 movies that we rented or streamed or saw on cable. Yeah. And most, almost all of them were just dreadful, awful, terrible movies. But I saw the movie Bright with Will Smith. <laughs> That's supposed to be bad. I haven't seen you know it. What? Yeah, I suppose if you're going to be critical and you know judge it by its content and stuff, it's no but, worse than the Last Jedi. I I enjoyed it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like it's like being live action D and D kind of sorta. Shadow Run, thank you. It's live action Shadow Run. It was all right. It was fine. You know, I actually hope to make another movie. Yeah, they will. Well, that's the quality of the movies I was watching this past Christmas. Is this one of those movies that the critics hate and the uh, the audience loves? Is this that sort yeah. of thing? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of backlash right now because it was written by Max Landis, who has been named in a couple of rape assault cases and uh, people don't want him benefiting from the success of this film understandably 
Yeah. Well. Well, so for the last three weeks, I have tr been trying to burn through a book every two days because my to be read pile is insane. Yeah. And I've read a lot of crap. What crap have you read? But I'm not going to talk about the crap I've read. All right. But this by Sam Gaffer, the dreamer in the fire. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed short story collection, mostly Lovecraftian. Um, I think Sam is really down because he like, feels like he hasn't done anything this year. But Sam released three books this year. And if this is the quality he's putting out, then I'm I, I need to I should have picked up the comic book he did. Yeah. I think and it was very good. I think that Sam is a talented guy who's too hard on himself. He should ease up on himself yeah. because he's 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 a talented guy. You know, yeah. and I, I, I think a lot of people realize it except him. So if if you're listening, Sam you need to realize it too, buddy. Yeah. So the, the title again, so people can pick the it up. The Dreamer in Fire. It's from uh, Hippocampus Press. Yeah, that's a mighty to read list. Okay. High on my to read list. Just that I'm backed up like uh, Pete. But did you read the House of Nodens as well? It is. It is in the pile. I wanted to put a little distance between this book and that one, um, and hopefully, when I get to the House of Nodens. It will clear my palette of this crap that I'm reading right now. And, and isn't that your favorite publisher who put out the House of Note? Never mind, I won't. Say it. It's it's hip, uh, I think it's Hippocampus as well. No, Dark Regions put, put oh, it's out. Dark, no, it's Dark Regions. I'm sorry, okay. but House of Note is excellent as well. Yeah, I want to see that. Uh, it's in my stack. Um, it's so. marginally mythos. Okay. It's got a couple of references in there, but it's a different take on Nodens, and I think it's the correct take. Okay. He, he can, he's not a he's not a benevolent god. He's meant well, to. He, I think he's evil in all his contexts in, in yeah. Lovecraft, as well as Mackin. Yeah, I was uh, I was traveling, and I decided to. In, when I travel, I don't like to read novels because, you know. So I picked up a couple short story anthologies and. You know, I'm wading through um, volume four in a what, what appears to be a six volume series, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm not happy with it. So, well, for those who missed it, um, it's the Dreamer in Fire by Sam Gafford, Hippocampus Press. You can Google all that. I'm sure you'll come right to it. I'll put it on uh, the okay, and his other ones, the House of Nodens. From uh, Dark Regions. And we had mentioned, uh, what was it, Life of a Non-Entity? Is that the title? Yeah. Non yeah. Which is from PS Publishing. Which is really a very clever thing. I mean, okay, how many authors of pulps and stuff do people not take their creation? They take the author and they have adventures with him. It's like, I, maybe I'm just baffled here. It's like you never go sleuthing with Arthur Conan Doyle. You don't go swinging through the jungle with Edgar Rice Burroughs. And yet there's a whole genre of stories where Lovecraft is the character. You know, and it's like, I don't freaking get it. I never have. And I just, it's like, well, what kind of world building are you going to have? And then, But it's like a, an unstoppable avalanche. But at any rate, what... What Eckhart and Gafford did that was so cool was they didn't do a story about Lovecraft. They did Lovecraft's story. They did his biography as a graphic novel. And mm -hmm. it's basically a depiction of his life. You know, it's really very well done and very clever. So, Sam? I will, I, I will say that. I, guy. I, I think that there are some books in which you do go sleuthing with Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah, there are a few, but but they're overwhelmed by the Holmes ones. Yeah, yeah, but like I could see like if someone wanted to take um, Inspector Lagrasse, and you know me and Inspector Lagrasse, we're gonna go fight crime and shit and meet Cthulhu. But 
Lovecraft as a character? It just yeah. it boggles me. Well, so to C.J. C. C. Henderson did that with Lagrasse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but who, who would want to hang out, you know, with uh, Lovecraft in Providence fighting deep ones? It's like, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, he's not really the fighting deep ones type, I would imagine. Probably Peter Cannon. That's who we'd like to hang out with. Yeah. Uh, is, are there any other movies or books that you guys read or watched over the holidays that you want to talk about before I move on? I read uh, Joe Hill's Strange Weather. Yeah. It's... Um, Strange? Mm, so, like his pop, it's four novellas. And... The first one I liked quite a bit, and then every other one felt like an unfinished story to me. So uh, it was the first Joe Hill book that I walked away from being uh, unsatisfied. Mm. Okay. So that was a bummer. All right. Anything else? Mm, not that I want to talk about. I do, you know, so I found this yesterday. I went on a trip. I took my son back to college in Orlando. Embrace the mutation. Embrace the mutation. It's a limited edition chat book fe featuring stories by J.K. Potter and Caitlin Kiernan. And it's signed by Kiernan in the back. But um, it turns out it is not, this is a sort of, um, it was a companion volume to this collection, to this anthology they did called Embrace the Mutation, in which the sto stories were written uh, using J.K. Potter's art. And this is sort of like a companion volume to it. And uh, it's the one story I was really happy is uh, by Kiernan is a dramada Among the Stones, which is a, a Lovecraftian story. So I'm pretty happy to find that. Um, I'm going to have to read that tonight. For anyone who's interested, there's two days left on a Kickstarter of Lovecraftian playing cards and it's a really successful Kickstarter. Uh, they asked for 1600 and they're at 9,200. Uh, just Google HP Lovecraft trading cards, the completed series, and you'll come to it. Some pretty neat images, pretty neat cards. So, uh, anybody watch X-Files? I did. I have not yet. It took me by surprise that there was the season was coming up. I guess I didn't know or pay attention or what. I don't know. Do you watch anything else on Fox? I don't <laughs> I know watch where this Fox. is going. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, it's pretty easy. <laughs> you didn't know about it because you didn't see the twelve thousand advertisements that they ran every hour. Yeah, no. it was. It was on the, every time I watched The Gifted, I got an X file. Uh, commercial i don't really have tv i have hulu netflix and yep. amazon you know i don't have live tv yeah so uh did you like no spoilers did you like the first episode i got i'm gonna i gotta watch it this week because kelly and i are gonna do a patreon podcast it's one of the things we're gonna talk about later in the week um so on friday i went to a meeting that could have been a memo and I would say it says that a lot about her work. <laughs> what was that? This could have been an email. Yeah. After, after a long three hour meeting, this could have yeah. been an email. Could have been an email. And I will say that I think that the convoluting path that we went through to get to the punchline of that episode was not worth it. Hmm. Okay. It just it didn't work for me. Is this a limited season? I okay. I think it's only six episodes. I'm not sure though. Okay. The, so the last season, what was it like? Two years ago, ended on a cliffhanger, right? The last I, remember. I could barely tolerate it. It was it was, just, was not that great. Yeah. I don't even want to watch it anymore. I don't. Like, I'd rather have my memory from the 90s than even go back and watch the old series. Yeah. Boy, that season one was something else, wasn't it? So you're telling me this was as big a disappointment as Twin Peaks? 
Man, you know, I the more more stuff I hear about, the more I think I need to sit down and watch Riverdale. You know, actually, I was going to allude to uh, Riverdale because there's an article on, let's see, clicking the wrong thing here, on cinemablend.com. No, sorry, wrong article again. Uh, here we are, cbr.com. I'm sorry. Uh, it yeah. says the title of the article is Riverdale and Sabrina may share one Lovecraftian universe. Mm -hmm. Google that if you want to read it. Yeah. Riverdale is trashy fun. I'm enjoying it. Okay. Is it Lovecraftian? No. But if you're a fan of Twin Peaks, uh, that first season at least evokes a lot of the stuff that you liked about the original Twin Peaks. Well, there you go. I'd say I've seen the I've seen the like maybe half of the first season, and then I got distracted. I, I did enjoy what I saw. I, I think if you like the small town with hidden dark secrets theme, you're definitely going to like Riverdale. When you say Kelly, yeah, it's it's yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Um, one thing I did forget to mention, and somebody just brought it up in the live chat, uh, David Delcall, I did see over the break um, The Shape of Water. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> it's just not showing here. It should be showing everywhere now because yeah. I, I went and saw it at, in a little tiny, really cool, expensive theater, and then the next weekend it had opened at the theater right next to my house. <laughs> Yeah, it's showing everywhere in my neighborhood. I just haven't been, you know, I have family in town and nobody wants to go see the crazy little horror art film with Pete. So go alone. That's the best way to see a movie. Yeah. Well, apparently my wife and kids are going out of town this weekend. So, you know, I will pull for a 72 hour stay awake and do all the stuff that I want to do that nobody else wants to. It's the summer of Pete. Three days of Pete. There was there was a summer of Pete, but that was like thirty years ago. <laughs> I well, assume I that say, the movie was good. Yeah, I can say that everybody on this panel is going to enjoy it. Okay, good. I think I just realized why uh, I'm using. I've got my camera off, and, <coughs> and my internet is not the, as as it should be because it's storming outside. Mm. Big thunder and lightning. Oh, very, so, very frightening. Uh, well, in the sense that if it cuts off the chat, yeah. <laughs> Scaramouche. Scaramouche. So, Shape of Water. We'll have to go see it. And yeah, then thumbs discuss up. It. Uh, uh, you have a story in Cthulhu Deep Down Under, don't you, Pete? No, that's the Aust I think that's open to just Australian authors. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'm thinking of the wrong one. I have a question mm -hmm. about that. Um, yeah, I don't know if you remember. I think it was a. It was not. Maybe it wasn't a Kickstarter. It was an Indiegogo back when that was a thing. They had an Australian anthology, um, Cthulhu down deep down under. Yeah, well, that's what we're talking about. Right, but this was the original printing, and now did they divide it into two books? Oh, no, this. I'm talking about volume one. Yeah, but apparently I, there's I didn't know if like the two. Australian the version that was originally published years ago. They were they only made a few of them, and I, I just don't know if it's worth it for me to buy the. Do you know for sure it's the same thing? This one's got a foreword by Ramsey Campbell. Yeah, I, I think that they one. had these stories, and they had this contract, and it it didn't sell on Indiegogo, so they were nice enough to fulfill these pledges. But I'm, I would like to know if anyone knows if this is the same thing. Well, do you have the first book? Yeah, I did. Of course, I got. Uh, can you check the the table of contents against what's on Amazon? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, yeah, but he has no idea where it is. Uh, well, this is available for in print and Kindle on Amazon. Yeah. All right. So, so over the week, yeah. take a look. Is it introduced by Ramsey Campbell? First of all, uh, there were twenty-four Australian tales of terror. 
with color plates, and the editor was Steve Proposh. Yep, that's the first Kara and Bryce Stevens. Introduction by Andy yeah. Campbell. I mean, it must Campbell. be must be the same book then. I don't I don't know. A picture of Ramsey Campbell. That is actually a pretty good picture of Ramsey Campbell. That's a great yeah, picture. Part of this is really lovely. Like, uh, oh, I didn't know Man Thing was Australian. Looks 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 like the spawn of Cthulhu and Man Thing. Um, so I don't know. I just I didn't want to buy another. I'm trying to buy less books this year. It's just not working. Good luck. Yeah, no, stop. Just stop that. Do pick some other thing to do, not do. You know, I have, I have okay, I won't. I won't bathe. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> You live in Chicago, right? You live in Illinois, right? So you're, yeah, yeah you're. Fine. I think that will annoy your family more than <laughs> not cluttering up the place with books. I was thinking of test patterns. I don't. I got them two absolutely way different books mixed up. Oh, you got yeah. a story in test patterns, don't you? I do have a story in test patterns. The. Uh... Talk about test patterns for a second. So test patterns is a. Um... Was the concept behind test patterns was to to go back to the old kind of Twilight Zone Night Gallery Outer Limits anthology series, where the story was just wasn't a good story. It also sort of had this kind of moral uh, outlook to it, and um, <coughs> it went through a whole bunch of different you know machinations to to be produced but it can't, it's just some, something surprised it like one day before christmas it was released and i was like what so yeah i, I don't even have a copy yet but i have a, a story in it called the nomenclature of unnameable horrors um catchy title yeah well it's it sort of plays off the idea that you know despite the fact that we always call things unnameable inevitably we do give them a name and there's got to be a book or a, a, a volume for doing that and a, a rule book so to speak and this is one of the that's the idea behind my story we, uh, we we give them a name if we find out more about them i would say yeah if we don't they re remain unnameable yeah but you know we we have this we're sort of programmed to name things oh yeah um, even things we don't understand, like dark matter and you know, quantum strings, we we just throw names on things, and before we even understand what they are. That's a really good point, Pete. Yeah. So I played with that I, that concept in the Lovecraftian universe. Um, but to be clear, Test Patterns is not strictly a Lovecraftian book. But I. Think but it's just a really neat idea if you like weird fiction. Exactly. And it is um, optimistically uh, titled Volume 1. It is. It, is, it, uh, is it available now? It is available. You can order it from Amazon. Okay. All right. And uh, one day... Kindle, Kindle version 2, do you know? I, or? I, I, there is a Kindle version. Cause I, I, okay, that's good. So, yes, it's available. There you go. Uh, no... Uh, sorry about that, Benjamin. There's a Benjamin Handel, and there's another book for you to add to your list. Um, yeah, yeah, same thing with Matt. Matt, you have to buy another book. Sorry. Uh, all right, I already put in my cart. You bastard. <laughs> Apparently, your dog agrees too, Pete. Yeah, he. Um, so, like I said, I took my son home, and I'm in. I got my study back, right? Because he's gone. But the dog like wants to come in here and lay down and cry. So. Uh, I saw the Alienist trailer that for the series that's going to be on TNT. It looks pretty yeah. good. Matt's favorite book. Matt's favorite book, yeah. <laughs> He's like, screw you guys. A sarcastic <laughs> comment. Yeah. Uh, Between that and the upcoming The Terror... Uh, I've got some good TV viewing ahead of me. Yeah. What is the terror? That's based on Dan Simmons' novel, The Terror. 
Oh, the trailer is great. You gotta watch it. Yeah, it's kind of like the thing, but set in eighteen whatever. Well, it's not anything like the thing. I but, know, oh, but right. you know, the trailer, <laughs> I know it's not. But you know, I thought you were gonna tell me it's like it then. No. We, no. We, we, I mean, not 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 um, Stephen King's it. Well, it's, but it, 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 it the terror from beyond the space is what it's I, based on a real thing that happened. Um, yes. Of uh, this, these ships were lost, and I think yeah. they were only recently found a few years ago. We found one of the ships. Yeah. Uh, they, and they apparently froze in the ice, and all all hands were lost. And yep. Uh, um. The cannibalism may have taken place. Um, <laughs> And yeah. Simmons' story ha it has a healthy, healthy dose of supernatural stuff going on in it. Yes. Sounds a little like uh, Poe's Arthur Gordon Pym. Yes. Well, speaking of stories based on things that actually happened, uh, Kelly, you can help me talk about this. Shiloh by Philip Fricasi. Yeah. Holy cow. What a, uh, what a harrowing story. Uh... Shiloh is limited to 100 hand numbered copies. And I don't know how much they are because you have to email the publisher for inquiries. But uh, I really can't read this link out on air because it's long and convoluted. Um, I'm assuming if you, if you Google Shiloh, Philip Fracassi, uh, F-R-A-C-A-S-S-I, you'll find it. But it, talk about what this is based on, Kelly, because it's, it's, it's based it's an it's based on concept. yeah, it's based on the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War, and um, it was the first of the real battles that kind of let everybody know what they were going to be dealing with. It was incredibly bloody, thousands of lives lost. And uh, I didn't know this until Philip had talked about it. Um, apparently, there were some strange sightings during this in in real life. There were some strange sightings of of a glowing angel light, basically. Um, then Glow, what Philip uh, they glow bright <coughs> green. Right. What Philip then did was was took that and and made a story about it and, and tells you what that glowing light was. Um, he, you know, in typical Fracassi fashion, it's pretty gory. There are some scenes that, that make you go, Ugh. Um, and it's, it's, I think eerie is probably the best way to describe it. Um, because what happens is, is really strange. It's not a Lovecraftian story, but it, it is definitely a supernatural weird horror and i just i absolutely loved it it was so good there's an interesting side note that like uh, i think i was driving with isabel from her apartment in bronxville new york to my assignment in san antonio this was ages ago and we were going through tennessee and we had the choice i told her we could go to pittsburgh landing from here it's not that far and we could actually see the Shiloh battlefield and do a walkthrough. And so we ended up at Graceland instead. <laughs> it's a pay homage to the king. Yeah, right, right. And so we're like in the we're in, it's 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 so moving. We're like in the the eternal flame where Elvis's families and stuff is married, and there's this woman there, she's like in her fifties, I think, overly heavily made up in leather pants, and she's weeping and sobbing by the tomb. And I sat down beside her. I said, I know I spent $20, too. <laughs> well, I didn't, but I thought about it. <laughs> so so I did uh, Google Shiloh Philip Fricasi just now, and it doesn't really come up. The publisher's page doesn't really come up. So if you're on the Lovecraft Easy message board, the group on, on, on Facebook, um, I just posted it there. I'll try my best to remember to post it under the in, in uh, on the YouTube page later and on the um, podcast page. 
the the publisher so. is uh, Mount Abraxas, Mount Abraxas, and so if you Google them, I'm sure that it shows up on their website. And it's not a it's not a cheap book, but it is a extremely limited edition. If you're a book collector, this is one you should probably jump on. Yeah, Mount Abraxas Press. Abraxas is A B R A X A S. A B R A X A S. So you can find it that way, I'm sure. Um So yeah. Um What else we got to talk about? Uh Rick, did you want to briefly discuss the new Howard pastiches? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's uh, a deal made with, I believe it's a company in Australia called Heroic Signatures to come out with new role-playing Robert E. Howard games. And they got the rights to a slew of characters. It's Conan. From our point of view, the Children of the Night are there. Uh, Francis X. Gordon, Steve Harrison, Dark Agnes, Solomon Kane. Some other people I'm forgetting, but it was like a whole group of characters, and they're going to do some pastiches, uh, publish some pastiche novels and or stories as well. Uh, my feeling is I don't want to read another Conan story. Some of the other characters might interest me, but I've seen enough of Conan pastiches. Okay. Uh, you want to say anything else about that, or are you done? I'm done. Uh, I know Kelly is. Is anybody else watching Dark on Netflix? Uh, I'm like three episodes in. It's uh, very interesting. Yes, it is. Um, I'm watching it subtitled, so no one else in the family wants to watch it. But actually, I, I you can put it on English audio, and they're actually it's actually very well dubbed. Extremely it, well I, I kept hearing from people that they hated the dubbing on it. Really? Well, maybe I just don't listen to dubbing enough, but it it seemed to line up perfectly for me. Oh, I just I just like the German language, the feel that it gives me. You know, yeah, sure. even though I don't understand it, it's like I I'd rather read the subtitles because then it just kind of washes over me. And well, it, ha however you it's consume it. Love. The one problem was yeah, it's not French. The one problem with dubbing is to make those words fit, you have to make sometimes very subtle changes in the dialogue, which means different things. Like the number 40, 40 will become 48. And things like that, because that, that was, I, I, I once went through, uh, I played a spaghetti Western with its dub soundtrack and its subtitles. And this pointed out all the changes that were made to get the words to fit the actor that were uh, significant, in, at least. Maybe not so much in the story, but uh, numbers were changing. I mean, th there were things which might be important if you were writing a sequel to it or something. I, th I think Dark is well worth watching, though. I very much am enjoying it. I'm, I'll come out and say that I like it better than Stranger Things. Wow, really? I'm on the second episode now. I'm really liking it. Where do you get this? On Netflix. On Netflix. The, the Dark, okay. Yeah, just Dark. Just, you can just, just dark. dark. Yeah. Um, Kelly, you want to give a brief synopsis without spoilers about what, what Dark is about? Yeah. Um, it is about – it is a small – town in Germany that is finding that uh, some children have gone missing, and this case seems very similar to a case that happened 33 years prior. And I don't really want to say anything more than that, because I went into it not knowing any more than that, and at the end of the second episode, I was like, wait a second, is this what I'm watching? Because it it turn if you if you don't know anything about it, it turns in a way you are not expecting at all. Okay. And how uh, many episodes is this? It's 10 episodes, and it is, um, unfortunately, one season. 
uh, it is to be continued. It ends on a cliffhanger, and I wanted to throw my remote at the TV because I thought <laughs> that there was going to be an answer to the story at the end. But I, I will say that I thought it was the best TV series I had watched this year. I'm just trying to factor in the number of hours I'm going to spend watching this. So, uh, well, double it if you want to actually expect to understand what's going on, because, uh, or at least bring a spreadsheet with you, and it, it, it's not something you can watch and play on your phone with, or uh, do anything else with. It requires all of your attention. It, it tends concentration, yeah. all right. Only two episodes in, I've noticed that as well. So. Um, Kelly and I are going to do a Patreon podcast, as I said, later this week. Would, would you, we're going to talk about Dark as soon as I'm done with it. Would you characterize it as Lovecraftian? No. Uh, the overlying sense of weirdness, maybe? Yes. Uh, <laughs> what would you compare it sort of to... Um, doesn't have to be similar plot, but like uh, mood or a lot of people are comparing it to Stranger Things. I know that. There, I don't find that at all. It's very different. Yeah, so far there yeah. are reasons that it gets compared to Stranger Things as you get deeper into it. So you liked it better than Stranger Things. That's saying a lot, because I know you really like Stranger Things. I did. I liked Stranger Things a lot. Um, this was a show that I watched kind of out of the corner of my eye the first two episodes. Then that ending of episode two hit me, and I, I slammed on the brakes and went back and watched the first two episodes again. And then the next day, <laughs> I watched the next eight episodes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was, I was just completely drawn in. I loved it. Yeah, and in the I like the music too. I think I mentioned that to you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, I like the cinematography. There's some shots of like, this is just one example: a kid's biking down a lonely, dark highway in the middle of the night. You know, this is eerie feeling. This absolute sense of aloneness that you get from it. Um, it's it's really good so far. And I'm like I said, I'm only two episodes in. So now, now you can watch this dubbed or with uh, German with subtitles. I'm g gathering. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I know where you fix uh, turn on the captions in Netflix, so I'll be able to do that. I'll probably watch it in German with subtitles. That's what I did. I also prefer to get the original actor's inflection, even if I can't understand what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. The only dub, the only time I prefer subtitles is if it, the the story is having foreigners play Americans. Because like watching it in a, a spaghetti western with guys speaking Italian just doesn't work. Yeah. All right. Anything else you guys consumed over the holiday that you want to talk about? Yeah, I saved I saved the best for last. All right. Um, I found a podcast, you guys. Now, we can all agree that our favorite podcast is this podcast. Obviously. But if you are a fan of old Hollywood or old horror uh, films, I found a podcast called The Secret History of Hollywood. And uh, they've got just a ton of episodes. Now, most of them are not available right now this podcast has become popular they've gone back and they've taken all of their episodes on the classic universal films and they are retweaking those to make them sound as good as the new episodes but so far they are six parts into a history of val luton and rko's horror films and it is what? so insanely interesting and it's got this wonderful sound design the narrator is amazing it's like you're watching a movie it's it's like theater of the mind it's a movie um, in your mind yeah and and i when i say six episodes each of these episodes is two to three hours long wow oh, boy. and they focus on the history of film by film val luton starting with cat people 
And well, actually, the first episode is just Val Luton's childhood ending up with him getting the job at RKO. And then it goes on to Cat People, uh, The Leopard Man, uh, I Walked With a Zombie, all of these films. And I am embarrassed to admit that the only Val Luton films I had seen before this were Cat People and Curse of the Cat People. I have now since watched all of Val Luton's movies and I, I am just a monstrous fan of his stuff. But also a fan of this podcast, I went back and just watched or listened to the first two episodes, uh, Blood, uh, Bullets and Broadway, which is the rise of Warner Brothers Studio and James Cagney. And uh, this is only two episodes in, and I'm only through, you know, the beginning of Warner Brothers. And it's, it's just so fascinating. There's so much knowledge, and it's all delivered in, in a cinematic way in that if you were to close your eyes this narrator has such a wonderful voice and he does all the voices during conversations so he'll do a slightly different inflection or or throw an accent in when he's got two people talking and i'm just so engrossed with this i i jumped on this guy's patreon immediately because i just want more of these episodes and i mean six episodes 18 hours into the val luton story we are not through the val luton story there are more episodes to come so if anybody likes i don't know how you devour your podcasts i listen to podcasts all day at work and so i have just been sucking these up and filling my head with the secret history of hollywood Great secret history of Hollywood. Ooh, so. I have to work at work. Yeah, well, <laughs> Kelly bosses people around at work. I do. Don't, don't, isn't that your job? That is kind of yeah. my job. And it, now it, I do it with headphones in. It, it sounds great, but you need unlimited time for it. You do need to be able to um, to take a chunk of your day and listen to these things. Now, there's nothing saying you know I don't listen to these all at once. Um, you know, I listen when I've got time and, and just pick up where I left off. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to listen to podcasts if if you can't. I mean, listen at work. I mean, limit your time. If you have a job where you can listen and do your job, like, you know, maybe you're mow lawns or something. I can't think of a good example. You know, podcasts would be great. Right. But basically, you listen to podcasts and yell at people to do their job at the same time. <laughs> most most of my work is a lot of driving, and so uh, I get a lot of time in a vehicle, and, and I listen to the podcast there. Yeah, I just got a copy of The Rats in the Walls from the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, because I got many days a week, I got a 45-minute commute one way. So... It's really nice to have something great to listen to. That's that, true. That, Mutes that, are great for podcasts too. Yeah. That is excellent, by the way. Rats in the walls. I gotta listen to that. That's my favorite Lovecraft story, so I gotta listen to that one. They came up with a very ingenious way to get a lot of things into this story. I wonder how a lot of the audio only listeners to this podcast listen if they listen on their commute or if they listen, you know, when they go to bed at night or they're doing tasks around the house. I'm always curious. Feel free to write and tell me Lovecraft easing at gmail.com. I'm curious. Start an online poll. Yeah, I could do that. I could, I could start a poll in the group, but I, I think a lot of people that listen to the audio podcast are not necessarily part of the Facebook group. I'm not sure. So, oh, I could do a poll on Twitter. That's what I ought to do. I don't know. Write me, lovecrafteasyin at gmail.com. Okay, do we have anything else to talk about, guys? You're beating everything to death. Yeah. Uh, you have a prize, Matt? Yes, I do. It is, as you recall, The Littlest Lovecraft, uh, The Shadow Over Insmith by Trorex and... The Yonabella, really wonderful picture book, signed by both creators. Some lucky listener. So, yeah, if you want to get in on that, be uh, considered for that prize. Um, 
random drawing, send an email to Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com, Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com, and put uh, the title uh, in the subject, Shadow Over Ensmith, and put whatever you want in the body of the email. And in a week or so, I will, I will do that drawing. Um, I was just looking at the live feed, and someone with the screen name of Tonk82 says he listens to it live from Spain. It's 1.25 a.m. right now. So, hey, man, thanks for listening. Wow. That's pretty also, cool. go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to Never go to bed before the show is over. Never. I'm that never going to see something and interesting enough to keep you up at 1.25 in the morning. Kelly might. <laughs> no. But. No. This is obviously a young person. Uh, nine o'clock hits and my eyes close whether I want them to or not. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you guys for being on the show with me today. It's good to see you. We haven't done a podcast in several weeks because of the holidays. So What's good next? to see you guys. I might, I might have to miss. Okay. Yeah. Well, family obligations. Yeah. Well, if that's more important. <laughs> <laughs> It's not, but I can't admit that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Don't make me laugh, please. <laughs> oh, that's right. You busted out your spine or something, Shh. didn't you, Pete? Don't tell anybody. Okay. You're just glued together right now, barely. Yeah. <laughs> I've had to sew myself up, you know, with cotton thread. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks to the live listeners. Thanks to everyone who listens <laughs> later on in the week or or whenever you listen. So uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks.